Okay. Welcome. My name is Courtney Clark, and I serve as the program director of Everywhere She Maps for the Youth Mappers Network. Um, before we kick into the session and hear from our fantastic guest speaker, um, I just want to give you a little bit more information about Everywhere She Maps. So this is a program that's really designed um, to um, increase women's participation across the Youth Mappers Network. Um, as well as women's leadership, um, and to really provide for um, our students around the globe opportunities to develop professionally um, and learn about career development opportunities in the geospatial field. Um, so we know that critical features and attributes that are most relevant to women are often missing from maps um, because they are very underrepresented in the geospatial field. And um, so we want to strengthen the inclusiveness of the geospatial community to ensure that women's perspectives are represented in apps, websites, and mapping platforms. We do this uh, through a variety of activities, and the four core activities that we have are professional and career development opportunities, um, which is what you're attending today. We do this through these professional development sessions where we bring in experts from um, different geo-related fields to offer their um, guidance and their advice on building your career. Um, and we also have an internship matching program where we pair qualified Youth Mapper students with our partners who are looking for interns. Um, we have a cohort of eight regional ambassadors. These are women leaders in the Youth Mappers Network around the globe who are really um, the heart of our program and they work directly with Youth Mappers chapters to increase women's participation in those chapter activities. Um, and very, very happy to see we have uh, actually three of those ambassadors on the call today, Irene um, Tigadanke and Sharon. So. Um, Thanks for being here. And we also run mapping campaigns that focus on adding data to OpenStreetMap and doing analysis on issues that disproportionately affect women and girls. And then finally, um, once we're able to get together in person, um, COVID obviously has prevented this so far, um, but we will have a women in technology leadership. <laughs> All right, so with that, I'm very excited to introduce our guest speaker, um, Dr. Joseph Kersky. He has, he plays many roles and wears many hats, um, but one of them is uh, serving as an education manager for S3 or ESRI. Um, and we're super excited to have him. So I'll pass things over to you. Well, many thanks, Courtney. Greetings all. Joseph Kursky here with you all. Guten uh, Tag, Ni Hao, Merhaba, Bom Dia, Buenos Dias, Good Day. I know that you are all from all over the world and it's great to have you here. I'm here in Colorado and the sun is not quite have, has, has risen yet, but I'm happy to be with you all and so thrilled that you are excited about mapping, making a difference in the world, and so that's really what I want to get into in this four hour workshop. Just kidding, we don't have four hours. But I'd like to give you some inspiration and also some encouragement and some lay of the landscape in terms of where we are in geography, geotechnologies, and why it all matters. And I also intend for us to have a, a dialogue in the future. I don't want this just to be, okay, now go have a great career and live long and prosper. No, I'm on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me there. Feel free to contribute some questions to the chat today. But, but in the future, you know, you'll have my contact information and you'll know where to find me. I think it's really important for you all in this community to generate that professional network. I know you're in different stages of your educational and also your post-educational career, but it's so critical that we keep moving forward as a, as a community. And that's why I 
one of the reasons why I love youth mappers and working with the American Geographical Society. As never before, we are confronted with some severe problems on our planet, correct? Under, on, and below the planet, and above the planet. Uh, natural hazards, uh, racial, social, economic inequities, water, energy. I mean, look at the U United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, health. They're all complex. They increasingly affect our everyday lives, even though they're global in scope. They're, they're connected kinds of things. We'll talk more about that in a bit. And they're also spatial, right? They have to do with space and place and change over space and time. And so that's one of the reasons why I think that the geographical perspective and spatial thinking and the applied use of geotechnologies to address those problems is the only way we're going to chart a more sustainable, happier, healthier, more equitable future, right? That's why we're doing what we're doing. So I just ask you to, to consider a couple of things here. What do you wanna see in society, in your community? We all want to have this more resilient future built. And that's why I admire you all. You are doing that very thing. We've got to step up our efforts, right? Some of the trends, despite rising awareness of these issues are going in the wrong direction. Ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, right? We could go on. However, I'm actually quite optimistic that we're going to see our way through this in part through groups like you all. So we'll chat about that today. Also, as you know, from being students and also being members of society, education is also undergoing massive amounts of disruption. And it happened before COVID, correct? Where educational institutions were saying, how do we meet the needs of students going forward? How do we chart our course to 2030 going forward? But I would submit two things. First of all, education will continue, right? It's going to be hybrid, online, face-to-face. -face. It's going to be a combination of those things. Education has always been innovative in terms of using technologies, learning management systems, and other things. It may not look the same at the end of the decade that it does now. It probably shouldn't look the same, we could argue, right? Because education does need to change and morph and change to meet the needs of the global society, especially as you well know, using geotechnologies in Youth Mapper and beyond, the world of geotechnologies, remote sensing, geographic information systems, global navigation, satellite systems, web mapping, as that evolves rapidly, and that has huge implications as well. So geotechnologies will continue. There were some articles 20 years ago that said geotechnologies is not going to be a thing in 2020 because it's going to be so embedded in mainstream IT workflows. To some extent that's happened, in other words, in a national government or in a local government or in a nonprofit or even in academia, you would have the situation as follows 20 years ago. Oh, the GIS people, yeah, they're down the hall and to the right. If you need some maps or some spatial data, go see them. They're a little bit nerdy and geeky but they're nice people, go talk to them. But now geotechnologies and spatial thinking are starting to be valued throughout an organization as a asset, as an asset to that organization. So therefore organizations are saying, we need to empower more of our staff to use geotechnologies and spatial thinking. Why do I keep saying spatial thinking? Because it's great that you, you youth mappers, you students, you other folks that are on here today are learning how to buffer and overlay and map data in the field and, and analyze it. But the goal of using geotechnologies is never to just learn how to buffer and overlay and, and do arcade expressions or whatever else you're doing, symbolize and classify data, right? The goal is always to understand something in a deeper, richer way, whether it's water or energy or climate or weather or any other variable right? That's the goal is to understand our world. Geotechnologies is a means to a greater goal. So the goal is never to learn ArcGIS Pro 2.5, right? Those are enabling tools, any GIS software. But remember that, remember that higher, more noble goal is out there. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go forward. 
Now, I also wanted to share with you a little bit of, as I promised, my contact information, but also my pathway, not to, not to bore you to tears with my own pathway, okay, but to give you encouragement in a couple of th different things. First of all, I've had a background in four different sectors of society, nonprofits, so I was president of the National Council for Geographic Education. I love geography education. I've talked to Courtney numerous times about this government. So I was at major U.S. federal agencies, Census Bureau, you know, our National Statistics Agency, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the U.S. Geological Survey, so a, a science and mapping organizations. I'm at ESRI now, as Courtney mentioned, Environmental Systems Research Institute on the education team. More about that in a minute. So private industry, private company making GIS tools so that people can make smarter, wiser decisions. And like many of you, I love education. So I teach in different colleges and universities uh, every semester. I teach at least one or two courses to keep in touch with students, to understand what their challenges are, and to also have an affinity for faculty going through some of these same struggles. How do I teach some of these concepts with this web GIS platform? So I teach geography, GIS, environmental studies, et cetera. So four basic sectors of society. I, I just raised this Again, not to bore you with my own pathway, but to have you think about, you know, spatial thinking and geotechnologies can be valuable in any one of these four sectors of society. You know, if Joseph can do it, I can do it too. So you can be valued in different sectors, depending on what your interests are. And the second thing I wanted to encourage you with to share my own pathway is that you can change. You're not stuck with one organization for the whole rest of your career. Nothing wrong with that. But as you can see in my case, I've actually moved around because I wanted to present myself with different challenges over time. So I hope that's encouraging to you. Also, you can see my contact information here. As I mentioned a moment ago, I would love to keep in touch with you all uh, in the future. So feel free to contact me at any time. I'm rather passionate about all this. This, this is my Our Earth YouTube channel. I've got over 5,000 videos on that channel, folks. So just to show you that I, I, I do care about the earth, its people, the environment, and dealing with change. So that's, that's the goal of that Our Earth channel. The other thing that I wanted to share is that my main role on the ESRI education team is actually to support faculty, students, administrators, deans, in the effective use of geotechnologies on their campuses and in their schools. So I actually work with schools, primary, secondary, community, technical, tribal colleges, universities, libraries, museums, anywhere where there's education happening. I don't do this alone. I have a team of about 15 people with me here at ESRI. The education team here has been around since 1992. And if you've got any sort of questions, struggles, with using GIS in education, that's what we're here for. That is our sole goal is to help people make more effective use of these tools. Why? Because the tools can be, again, not the end goal, but they can enable people to be change agents, change agents in society. That's what we want and what I know all of us want. We want people to be empowered to make a difference, a positive difference in their community, in their university, in their country, in their world. That is the goal. And I also, on a career note, encourage you, when you're thinking about working for an organization, to do your homework, if you know what I mean, do the research to find out what that organization is all about, what their core values are, and try to think about how your own personal core tenets or values match, at least in part, that organization's values. So in the case of ESRI, we've been around since 1969, our three values is what you see here, education, sustainability, and science. That's been our mission the whole time we've been around. And the reason why we exist is, again, to serve users in all sectors of society from A, A to Z, A to Z, uh, agriculture and archaeology to zoology, really, and everything in between, public safety, utilities, transportation, health, etc. So I wanted to get you to think about that because oftentimes people in the past and at present 
And I've had this experience in different organizations I've worked for. For example, when I worked for the US Geological Survey, you know, I love natural landscapes. This is one of my nat favorite natural landscapes here in Colorado, canyons, mountains, mesas, is I wanna work for the USGS Joseph because I wanna get out in the field and actually, you know, observe, you know, plants, animals, landforms. Well, okay, that's great. But, you know, why should we pay you to go out in the field and, and observe? What are you going to bring to the organization is the main is the main point. And here at ESRI, oftentimes we get people saying, hey, you know, I would love to work for ESRI. I'd love to just, you know, play around with GIS all day. OK, it's, it's good that we all want to learn more GIS. Good. But what are you going to contribute to these three missions in our organization? So I want you to think about that as you chart your course forward, unless you're one of the small number of independent consultants in geography and geospatial, and they do exist. You still have to, even if you're an independent consultant though, you got to think about your customers, right? Your clients, your, your patrons, whoever it is you're serving. It's not all about you, but especially if you're working for an organization, how can you contribute to the mission of that organization? And therefore, why should they hire you, correct? So I wanted you to think about that. The other thing I wanted you to think about as you go forward is, how are you going to make a difference in the world? In my case, I spend a lot of time writing, speaking, uh, presenting, creating curriculum. This is one of the essays that I write on a, every other day. Uh, so this is all about, hey, how do I teach about social justice using geotechnologies? And one of the tools I have in here is something called policy maps. This touches on some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. And that is the whole web enablement of GIS. It, may, it, it has huge implications being able to share data, results, and use these tools effectively, even by non-GIS experts. People that don't know that much about geotechnologies can use, for example, these ESRI maps for public, public policy to understand situations and then take action. The whole taking action part is really important to me. So we'll talk more about that. That's again, why I love you folks at the Youth Mappers. You're making a positive difference in the world. And I've worked with many Youth Mappers organizations uh, and chapters over the years through Patricia Solis and others. And it's been a real joy. So this is one of the uh, policy maps that I've got in that essay. So in my case, how can I make a difference is actually working with these uh, essays, videos, tutorials, meetings with universities and schools to help them, encourage them, help them use tools, but also how do I incorporate this into my teaching and learning? That's one of the things that I do uh, on a daily basis. So I'm going to have a couple of guidelines here, but let's talk about geotechnologies and geography a, a bit more. I want you to think about the following as well. What are some things that you like to do that maybe none of your friends likes to do? That's okay, that's unique to you. It's okay that you share some things with other people, but there might be some unique things that you can bring to your future workforce experience. Again, that, that makes you a valued employee that again, nobody else likes to do. Now we're all anchored in space and place. So I thought I'd share, this is where I am located right now, Colorado Front Range and mountains and Great Plains tall or actually short grass prairie. So it's at the intersection, it's at the boundary between two different eco regions, okay? And another thing touching on what I was just mentioning is that these are the photographs that I actually took as, as a teenager. So all of my photographs are either of land, natural landscapes or human built landscapes. I have very few people in actually, actually in my pictures, not that I didn't want to associate with people, but I, even at that age, I had this sort of geographical eye on things. I like to go into buildings and take certain angles. I like to get into certain natural landscapes, uh, canyons, et cetera, and take pictures there. And I also, probably no surprise to you all, and maybe you can relate to these sentiments, like to make maps. In my case, the maps that I made, as you can see here, are, they're hand-drawn. They're of made up places, but I had mountains, I had valleys, I had railroad yards, I had freeways, I had lots of streets on my maps. So street maps and contour maps are two of my favorite kinds of maps to make. So again, that's kind of unique to, to, to me. What, what do you like to do that nobody else likes to do? Embrace that, bring that forward to your future employer saying, these are the, my unique experiences and unique perspectives on the world. Now I submit to you all today that 
These geotechnologies that we're talking about are essential for learning and also essential for the planet. Why do I say that? Well, because the, the issues and challenges that our world faces, we've talked about a few of them. You could probably mention a few more in the chat box if you wanted to, but the issues and challenges that our world faces, they don't stop at physical borders like the, like the ridge line behind me or the watershed line behind me. They don't stop at mountain ranges. They don't stop at valleys, right? They don't stop at physical borders. They transcend physical boundaries. They also transcend political boundaries, right? They're not just your country, my country, your city, my city, your district, your region, and my region. They, they transcend political boundaries, right? Water quality, health. They, they don't pay attention to political boundaries. And third, perhaps most importantly, but they also transcend disciplinary boundaries. What do I mean by that? They are not just economics, they're not just geography, they're not just sociology, they're not just biology, right? They transcend all of those things. And so the perspective that you and I love, the holistic, geographic, spatial perspective is going to be very important going forward. You can sort of see that starting to happen now with some of the trends, of the five trends that I'll talk about here in a moment. But I just ask you to, to take those messages and be an advocate for why this matters to the people that you're interacting with, including your future employer, that these technologies are not just a niche technology and not just niche ways of thinking about things. They are incredibly relevant to solving our 21st century problems, right, folks? Now, everybody has, to some extent, seen some of the tools that I'm talking about right now. For example, um, I want you to think about this. Everybody has seen the JHU COVID dashboard. That's a dashboard, it's built on ArcGIS technology, which is from ESRI, but the point is that dashboard has been seen by trillions of devices in the T. Everybody with a phone, laptop, tablet, et cetera, has seen the JHU COVID dashboard. Why? Because it's very useful. It's global, but also you can zoom into your local area. It's getting feeds from the WHO, from the CDC, from other countries, health organizations to feed that. So dashboard technology is part of this geo-awareness that I've got on the left side here. People are becoming aware of issues, health, transportation, water, energy, all the things that we talked about earlier as never before. It's not just the geographic community talking about this, it's the general public. So when I'm on work travel, for example, I'm not on work travel at the moment, but hopefully very soon, I would hear increasingly in stairwells, in airports, in train stations, people talking about these issues that formerly the geo enviro community was the, really the, the bulk of the people talking about that. But now so many more people are talking about them. And that's good. So the awareness is at an all time high. What we do with the awareness is a big challenge as we'll talk about. And people are also enabled to use these tools, right? Anybody with a phone has used that to navigate to their grandmother's house, across camp to their, you know, to the library, across campus, et cetera. They've used navigation tools and increasingly people use fitness apps, right? Recording your walks, your runs, uh, your cycle rides, et cetera. So people are starting to be enabled, even the general public, to use some of these geotechnologies. Okay, and the geotechnologies themselves having evolved into this cloud based format, it has huge implications, as I hinted at earlier. And as you know, working with youth mappers, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to enable that youth mapper data to be collected if it hadn't been for web evolution of geotechnologies. If it was just in former times, still the way it is, if, if we had just desktop only GIS like we had for several decades. It was very difficult to share data. It was very difficult for like Courtney and I to share geospatial information with each other. Why? Because it was all on, it was all on physical media, DVDs, and uh, you know, it's too big to email, and uh, you know, all these physical and, and technological challenges. I'm not gonna say it's easy now. We're still trying to model the three dimensional and understand the three-dimensional complex oblate spheroid that is our planet, right? We're still trying to understand our planet and all of its complexities. We've got a lot going on. We've got seven and a half billion people modifying the planet in various ways, positive and negative, right, folks? We've also got natural forces, volcanism, plate tectonics, et cetera, happening on our planet, rivers modifying the landscape, et cetera, et cetera. So GIS and spatial thinking, the geographical approach is never going to be just click, click, click done, all my problems are solved. 
And that's good because it always requires this tool. Your brain is the most important spatial thinking tool out there, not buffering in ArcGIS you know, online or ArcGIS Pro 2.5. You know, those again are enabling tools, but this tool right here is your most important spatial thinking tool and the tool that we most need to solve our world's problems. But the geotechnologies in the cloud is huge for several reasons. One, it's, isn't it great that you've got music in the cloud now? So you can listen to ABBA's greatest hits. No, that was a band, by the way. Anyway, the point is, you've got music in the cloud, Spotify, Pandora, Apple Music, Amazon Music. So you can listen to it at any device, anytime, anywhere, correct? And those, those music services are running on some server somewhere. You don't really care where, as long as you can access the music that you want. Same thing with documents. If you're sharing documents with a colleague or with a fellow student, right? You're using OneDrive or Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that, right? So you can collaborate. As much as it's wonderful to have music and documents up in the cloud, having the tools, the models, the, the spatial data, anywhere, anyway, geotechnologies in the cloud is even more important, I would argue, because to solve these problems, again, requires collaboration among people with different backgrounds and different disciplines, uh, different disciplinary knowledge. So geotechnologies online is a huge leap forward to help us to collaborate and solve these world problems that are increasingly, again, affecting our everyday lives. And no surprise to you all, I believe citizen science is a key one of these five forces. You all are a perfect example of that, youth mappers and other bio blitz, other citizen science efforts. I mean, citizen science goes back to the 19th century, right? Really, at least with people observing birds, bird species, bird uh, types, the call of the bird, the species of the tree that the bird was in, the time of day that the bird was in the tree, et cetera, and collecting it on analog clipboards and so on. And how do you map that? Now with geotechnologies, they can instantly map not just birds, right, but other species and other phenomena on our planet. So citizen science is contributing a huge amount, even outside of youth mappers, to the, our global understanding. So for example, here where I am in Colorado, USA, we've got, as many other parts of the world, we've got invasive boring insects in trees. And that's a problem, right? So how do we collect where those pine beetles are boring into trees and killing them? It's not gonna be from national agencies like the Park Service or the, or the Forest Service. They've got a very small number of field staff. In the late 20th century, many of those field staff are pulled into the office for budgetary reasons. So there's very few of those folks out there from those agencies around the world. Where's that data gonna come from? Citizen scientists. And sure, we've got data quality issues, right? Everyone nowadays is a map maker, not just a map creator, not just a map user, right? Everybody's a creator of maps, thanks to geotechnologies and citizen science, including you all, which I love. And finally, storytelling with maps. This whole presentation that I'm giving at the moment, I'm gonna put this in the chat box because I'm not gonna have, A, I'm not gonna have time to, uh, go through the whole thing, but B, I want you to dig into the things that I'm not covering because of time constraints, but C, the reason why I'm showing this as a story map because is to show you that, guess, guess what? There are 3 million story maps in existence now. Story maps came around in, nine, in 2010 uh, with, with Alan Carroll coming over to Esri from National Geographic where he was chief cartographer. And he said, I've got this vision for everybody being able to make simple but effective and powerful interactive story maps. And so we said, hey, Alan, you know, come over to Esri. Well, here, here's, your, here's a team, here's the platform. And so Alan and his team made a story map every week for about two years. That'd be kind of a cool job, wouldn't it? But more importantly, the global community said, hey, we want to make story maps on whatever issue in our own community is of concern to us, traffic or graffiti or crime or whatever it is. So that's why there are 3 million of these in existence now. Again, a wide variety of quality. So we need to be critical of the data, just like we need to be critical, critical of any map that we see, digital or analog. More about that in a minute. In a minute. But the point is, this story maps and storytelling with maps, I mean, maps have been used to tell stories for thousands of years, right? On clay tablets, the Babylonians, right? Al Idrisi's map of, on two silver plates in the 1100s, um, wood blocks etched in dirt, and then over the last hundred years on copper plates, 
made into film so that we could reproduce maps and now in the digital world. So no, no paradigm shift there, except that nowadays at your fingertips, you can create story maps and other kinds of maps with these web-based geotechnologies. It's really exciting. I wish I could get excited about this, Courtney. Anyway, does anybody have any questions as we're, we're going we're gonna to pause here for a moment, see how folks are doing. Hopefully not, nobody's asleep and saying, Joseph, this is the most boring presentation ever. Hopefully you're yeah, thanks for the, the JHU link there. And you can see my link that I put. Hopefully you're, you're very engaged and you're saying, yeah, you know, I, I, this really connects with me. So another thing that I wanted to share is as follows. Let's say you go to, as an example of what I was chatting about earlier, one of the libraries of spatial data is the ESRI ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World. It has ArcGIS Online has millions of content items, millions of maps, data layers, images, raster and vector data formats. Uh, again, from A to Z, archaeology to zoology themes. The Living Atlas of the World is a subset of all of the content in ArcGIS Online. It's an authoritative subset. Doesn't mean it's perfect, right? We're still trying to model this world of ours and we've got map projection issues that distort the planet to get it into a 2D or even a 3D scene in a GIS. So we've got some we've got some data quality challenges right there. But the point is the subset of the ArcGIS online community is called the Living Atlas and it gets data from a variety of sources. CDC, World Health Organization, United Nations Environment Program, a uh, national government uh, census and statistical agencies you name it, there's a lot of data in there, 8,500 data layers. So that's good, but I want people, again, to be critical of that data. With one touch, if I go to the, if I search on human development index and I see there's this feature layer over here, then I can say, oh, okay, I can instantly map that, that data inside ArcGIS Online. I can say, oh, the human development index according to that source. So we could look at the metadata and find out who created it when it was created, how often is it updated, et cetera. And also I've got the capability, as you probably know from being people in, interested in GIS and doing GIS, I've got a variety of other things in here. I can say, well, gosh, wouldn't it be great to be able to say, gosh, what, what, what do I want to map? And how do I want to map it? Well, I have population, for example. If I add that, okay, well, I've got now human development index and I also have population. So I've got a, a bivariate map now. Okay. So with, with, with just a few seconds inside, in this case, ArcGIS Online, I've got two variables. I've got different scales, right, that I can map and so on. Where did the data come from? Who created it? How did they classify it? How do I know if I can trust it? So anybody, as this illustration shows, is a map creator nowadays. I know you know that because you're in youth mappers and related organizations, but I want the general public to understand that too. With that amazing capability that anybody has on the planet with just a web browser, nothing to install, they can be making maps like this in ArcGIS Online, for example, and in other mapping tools. But with that great capability comes great responsibility, right? How are you classifying your data? How are you, what map projection are you showing, um, et cetera? So part of that passion of mine to help people understand the great potential for misuse of maps, I have a, I know this sounds super boring, super boring, Joseph's data blog, but it came out of a book that a colleague and I wrote for S Repress called GIS and Public Domain Data. And because these tools and these situations evolve rapidly, as you folks know, we wanted to keep the conversation going. So we have something called the Spatial Reserves data blog, where every week we post things about how do I find data, how do I assess its quality, I don't know if it's any good, and number three, societal issues around data, location privacy, ethics, and other topics, okay? So for example, I've got a post called Everyday Examples of Being Critical of Data. Some of these are, are rather fun, but they're all, I think, important for us to think about being critical of data. You don't just believe everything you see on the web, right? You, and you shouldn't believe every map that you see. So for example, everyday examples of being critical of the data. 
If you do a search, for example, in Google Maps of George Mason University, underneath it, it says simple Chinese fast food chain. Interesting. I thought it was a major research institution. Do they have a Panda Express inside their food court? I don't know why it says that, but being critical of the data. What about this one? Oops, this was in a catalog. And I did write, in fairness to the catalog publisher, I did write to them and say, you know, you really need to flip this map. In this case, the image orientation actually does matter. And to their credit, they did flip it. But for a while, it was it appeared like this. Oops, what about this one? I was writing a paper with our chief medical officer, Dr. S.D. Garrity, last year, uh, a research paper on the intersection between COVID, geography, and GIS, and education. And as part of that, as you know from writing papers, I had to look up where the National Academy of Sciences was for one of my references. And interestingly, it ended up in several of my searches being a house in Metro Denver. That's not the National Academy of Sciences, but that's what, that was the result in my, in my initial search, searching. I know it's a building in Washington, DC. It's not in Metro Denver and it's not a house, okay? So being critical of the data. Also, it's interesting because inside this ArcGIS platform, you can get real-time data feeds, weather, wildfire perimeters, stream gauges. Why? Because people want data increasingly in near real-time or as real-time as possible because the world is a, a dynamic planet, right? And we want to have that data at our fingertips. So we have a lot of data feeds that, coming in, that are coming into that. And I know it gets hot in certain places around the world. I know it gets hot in Texas, for example, but not this hot. So this was a data feed from one of those weather stations fed into ArcGIS Online. And if you weren't critical of the data, your interpolated surface that you made from that data would have a big spike on Cleaver in Texas. And that was online for a whole year. This is like Noah's flood, for one thing. Look at the precipitation rate. I mean, it's, it's, it's astronomical. The only thing that's normal on this temperature and pressure and et cetera reading is the pressure. That's the only thing that's normal. Everything else, look at the wind speed. I mean, it's, everything else is off the scale. Uh, definitely an error. And this is a, 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 so again, you know, even the data feeds can be wrong. So be critical of those data feeds. Don't just accept it because it's, oh, it's a real time data feed and therefore it's perfect. No, no. Here's a fun one. It's not spatial, but uh, look at this one. I've not heard of, I'm a pretty big, you know, Beatles fan, but I've not heard of some of these songs. Cans Buy Me Love, uh, A Day in the Sky. Those aren't even real songs. This is, this is not even an album. It's someone's misspelled playlist. So even non-spatial examples, be critical of them. Okay, so that's the Spatial Reserves data blog. And I'm going to put the link in the chat box here so you can see Again, that there might be some things that are relevant, uh, but it's all about being critical of the data, even, and I would argue, especially mapped data. Doesn't mean you shouldn't use and embrace this whole web-based paradigm of using maps. Use it. It's incredibly powerful. I keep thinking of, you know, scientists and cartographers of past centuries, you know, Zheng He from China and uh, Al Idrisi, they would have loved to have this at their fingertips. You've got it at your fingertips, so definitely use it. But again, be always thoughtful and critical. When you're going through a workflow in, a, in your GIS software, understand what the default settings are in that software and how to override them if necessary and what those algorithms are actually doing. Very important. All right. So another thing that I wanted to mention here as we go forward is I wanted to mention we've talked about five uh, forces acting. I want you to think about five trends in GIS and society, five trends. The reason why I want you to think about that is because of the following. GIS is changing, right? You know that from being in youth mappers and being around geo people, right? You know that it's rapidly changing. How do you embrace the whole idea of being a lifelong learner so that you can embrace these uh, uh, forces and trends? So the trends that I wanted to talk about is to get you thinking about how GIS is changing and therefore how you can chart your course going forward using these tools. So one of the things that I wanted to mention here is 3D. It makes sense since we've got a 3D world that we have 3D GIS tools. In the past, we've had 3D visualization tools in GIS. We could visualize landscapes and variables in 3D, but we couldn't really analyze. And now we've got 3D analytical tools, which is a good thing because again, we've got a 3D world. The whole touching, not merging, but touching of building information management, 
architecture, engineering, and construction, and GIS is, I think, one of the key trends going forward. The interior space mapping people were the CAD computer-aided drafting and design community for many years. The exterior space mapping people were the GIS people. If we want to have a resilient resiliency plan for a community or for a university campus or for a school, we have to have the interior spaces integrated with maps of the exterior spaces, right? So if it's 3 p.m. on a Friday and we have a major weather event on a campus, where are the students? Where are the faculty? Where are the emergency shelters, et cetera? And to have that happen, we have to have these two parts, the interior and the exterior, mapped and in the same system. So we have tools now, for example, ArcGIS Urban, ArcGIS Indoors, City Engine, and others that are bridging the boundary between the CAD BIM world and the GIS world, which is a very important thing going forward. Also, I touched on this with uh, my example of the erroneous Internet of Things feed, but I think it's important to note that being able to ingest real-time data into your GIS, again, because we have a web GIS world. In the past, when we were desktop only, and static devices, we could say, oh, I, want, I, I, can get the, I can download the weather data from 2010. That's what we were stuck with. Now, I want real-time weather data, thank you very much, from ocean buoys and land-based weather stations, or I want the real-time wildfire perimeters, or I want the water quality as measured the last time the youth mappers measured it, or whatever it is. That is a huge leap going forward to be able to plan for a more sustainable future. Enterprise and web GIS. I've talked about web GIS. What I mean by enterprise GIS is GIS th throughout an organization, no longer just the sort of down the hall and to the right people, the, just a, one or two people using GIS in a government agency or a nonprofit, for example, but everybody at least knowing something about geotechnologies. Maybe a few people know, need to know a lot about it, but a lot of people need to know at least a little bit about it so they can be empowered on their, in their day-to-day -day job of using some of these tools. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are the last one that I wanted to mention here. You may have a different list, and indeed, all of these lists are rather subjective, I, I admit, right? Just like other lists you see on the web. The, cool, the five coolest places to visit in Africa before you die, the five coolest bands of all time, the five, cool, the five most important trends, these are all a bit subjective, but I would submit that these are the important ones, at least, to think about going forward, and I'd love to hear your suggestions on what, I, what you think should be added to this list. But machine learning and artificial intelligence, being able to, for example, go down a, um, a street and capture, for example, video, and from that video, being able to capture from that video, that's a light pole, that's a, that's a mailbox, that's a, that's a flower garden, that is a street, uh, um, that is a sidewalk, and it needs to be repaired, et cetera. Being able to do that automatically is going to change a lot of those entry-level GIS positions for starters. You're not going to have to digitize parcels and all that kind of stuff so much into the future. It's going to be automatically gathered and assessed. And again, we need to be critical of the methods from these artificial intelligence means. For example, this video here of my trip to the South Dakota State University. I'm not gonna play it now, but just imagine everything I panned on that video being able to be automatically captured through artificial intelligence and then being able to be mapped and then understood, right? The map is not the end goal, right? The map is a means to a greater understanding, as I mentioned earlier. The other thing that I wanted to mention here is uh, as follows. I know we've only got a few minutes left here. So I'm gonna skip down in this particular story map to what I consider to be the top five, another list of five skills for geotechnology professors, professionals and instructors and students, all of us. My top skill that I believe is important is to be curious. That's why I love working with AGS and you all, because you're curious about the world. You wanna understand the world. You wanna take action. But being curious is the, first, is the first step in all of those things, right? The whole geographic inquiry model, asking a geographic question, gathering data, assessing the data, mapping it, analyzing, understanding, and then taking action, and it leads to additional questions. But it all starts with being curious about the planet. Why are those patterns? What are those relationships? What are those trends? Why do they exist? The whys of where? You know, geography has always been about What's where, why is it there, and why should we care? That's my mantra, and I'm sticking to it. What's where, why is it there, and why should we care? Why should we care about water quality, human health, uh, transportation, et cetera? So 
be curious. Don't ever lose that curiosity. Be tenacious. It, it helps you use software tools. It also helps you uh, get the job done. It helps you to meet deadlines. It, it's, there's so many good things about being curious. Being able to work with data and being critical of data, as I talked about in that spatial reserves blog and book discussion with a couple of those examples, which I hope are interesting. I've got a lot more on that site. But being able to be to work well with data, large variety and volume of data, big data, is so important going forward. So I also have some activities, by the way, on that spatial reserve site of, of ArcGIS Pro-based activities where you actually go and use spatial data from public domain data portals and then make decisions about resiliency, sustainability, population change, housing, et cetera. And also intertwined with that, and this is where I was working with AGS last year on their ethical geo blog. I wrote, a, I wrote an article about ethics. It's so intertwined with geotechnology. It's so important going forward and be, being critical of the data. And also knowing your geographic and geotechnical foundations. This is important. Again, a few people need to know a lot about geotechnologies, how to build a geodatabase, how to serve data, how to create a story map, for example, and communicate with that, et cetera. Those are all important skills. But remember, spatial thinking and this tool right here, your brain is the most important tool of all. And be adaptable. I know you are all from many parts of the world and I'm going to share one of my story maps that uh, I encourage you to share as well, a story map of your CV or resume here in a moment. But those international experiences have been very valuable to my career. I've made a lot of good relationships with people over the years that I still treasure. And so go outside of your comfort zone, go to a part of the world that uh, if you're able, that you've never been to before and work there for a while. Or if, you, if that's not possible, work outside of your disciplinary comfort zone. So even at a conference, virtual or face-to-face, -face, go to a session that is completely outside of your own wheelhouse, if you know what I mean. So at, at a recent uh, geography conference, I went to a, a social work track. I learned what their methods were, what they're concerned about. I met a lot of interesting people. I learned, et cetera. You know, it's outside of my own comfort zone, but I encourage you to do that as well. And then finally, good communications. Do you have an elevator speech? Your one minute speech about why your position matters and why you are passionate about what you are doing. Because in your future workplace, you're gonna be asked, hey, you're gonna be tapped on the shoulder or virtually in a Teams meeting or something. Hey, you need to go talk to the, to the CEO or the board of directors or the, or the share stakeholders or whoever it is, the city manager, and talk to that person about why your position actually matters and why they need to fund you for another year. And also you're sitting next to someone in a, on a train or in an airplane or someplace. What do you do? Why, why is it important? Why does it matter? Be prepared to articulate why what you're doing actually matters. Okay, another thing I want you to think about is this whole stool of geoliteracy. And I promise this is these are some closing comments here. I submit to you all that content knowledge is important. So let's say you're really excited about soils or landforms or climate or weather or whatever. That content knowledge is important. Their skills also are important. Communicating, analyzing, uh, et cetera, mapping. And then finally, the geographic perspective. Without that, the, the stool is wobbly, right? It could fall over. The geographic perspective is what you and I hold near and dear, right? It's the holistic view of the world and the interconnectivity of the biosphere, the atmosphere, the lithosphere, the, the cryosphere, the ice sphere, et cetera, right? The interconnected connectedness of those different spheres and also cycles. We think in terms of cycles too, don't we? The hydrologic cycle, the carbon cycle. So we think content knowledge and specialization is important, but we don't lose that spatial geographic perspective that, that wraps them all. I wanna think, have a couple of closing career focused comments. First of all, your social media presence. Our HR people, our human resources people at ESRI, my former employers as well, almost the first thing that they look at is your social media presence. Not to say that you can't have hobbies that you're showcasing, et cetera, but be cautious about what you're sharing. If it's just you partying, that doesn't reflect well, right, on your professional interests. So be cautious about your, your social media. Uh, you probably heard that from your professors and others, but I'll just confirm that that's, that's truly what our HR people look at. And as promised, I'm gonna close with this. Create a story map of your CV, a story map, a, a living, breathing, interactive, online 
story of your journey. You can still have a traditional CV. I still have a traditional CV, but it can work on any device. And most importantly, it shows your potential employer that you know something about WebGIS and may help your candidacy stand out. Now, I've got a couple of examples here. Amanda Huber, I've got my own, Emily Garden, Garding. In mine, for example, I have, um, not that it's the end all be all, I start with, okay, this is who I am. This is what some of the things I'm passionate about. I'm using the story maps tools. I, I, every semester or every quarter, I can update that. Where is this? Here's a little geographical quiz for y'all. Where, where am I standing right there? See if you put, put it in the chat box. But yeah, good point about uh, GitHub, et cetera. Thanks for sharing that. See if you can identify where I'm, where I'm standing there. While you're thinking about that, I want you to take a look at this part of my story map. I've got a interactive map in there of, I had an internship over here. I presented over here. I went to university here. I had this job over here. So make sure that there's at least one interactive web map in your story map. There are a lot of story maps that are just slides and videos and pictures and text, but the whole power of story maps is to have an interactive map. That's the whole beauty of a story map. So I encourage you to make at least one of those. Mine's pretty simple with just some simple pop-ups in it, but I encourage you to do that. There's a lot of things that you can put in there. Does anybody know where I was standing when I, when I took this picture? But anyway, I encourage you to, to think about creating a story map of your CV or resume. And it's a fun activity and it gets you into the story maps tools in a fun way. Okay, so I wanted to close it off there because I know we're up against some time constraints. However, I hope some of these things, the five forces, the five trends encourage you. I truly believe folks that wise decisions will be made with the spatial perspective and the use of geotechnologies to build this happier, healthier, more sustainable, more resilient, more equitable world that we're all seeking. And I, again, I salute you all. I've worked with uh, many of you in the past and look forward to future collaboration. Um, I, I wanted to encourage you that I believe that these perspectives, these tools that you're embracing will get us to our end goal. It's gonna take concerted effort and us working as a team but we're gonna get there. All right, all the best to you. Now, questions, comments? Joseph, um, we did have a question in the chat earlier um, from Irene asking, can anyone from anywhere in the world apply for positions with Esri? Um, and then she's also wondering, um, as a graduate of geography, what type of possibilities are there of getting jobs um, without a degree from a North American school? Yeah, absolutely. So great questions. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I would say, first of all, my organization is an international organization. Taking that into a couple of components. Number one, our headquarters is in Redlands, California, USA. I would say at least a quarter, if not a third, of our entire workforce is internationals. So uh, we've got uh, numerous people from at least 100 countries in that office. There, we have about 8,000 employees, probably around 4,000 are in our Redlands office. So the second thing I wanted to bring up was also that we have other offices. There's Esri Australia. Good on you, mates. She'll be right. We have Imagem over in Brazil distributing Esri technology. We have uh, Esri East Africa, there's Esri Japan, there's Esri Deutschland, there's, there's Esri offices internationally because people want the tools. And they also want people in their own regions and areas to understand how to localize, how to bring those tools effectively to needs in those countries. So sometimes they're called Esri something, like Esri Italia, and sometimes they have their own name, like Imahem or uh, Eagle Technologies in New Zealand, et cetera. So there's international offices. And the second, and the second part of, so it, it, I wanted to mention that. Yes, absolutely. We, we, we want those international perspectives. And the other aspect of that is look at our ESRI business partners. 
we have about 300 business partners that take our technology to certain disciplinary applications, water resources, city planning, and they so they, they serve a, a smaller market than the overall GIS market, but they also hire people and they're business partners of ours. So they use our technology, but they're independent businesses. Some have a few employees, some have hundreds of employees. So also look at the business partners uh, and their hiring as well. We're still hiring. I mentioned our chief medical officer that I wrote the article with uh, last year, S.D. Garrity. We have a health team. I think before 2019, people were wondering, why does a software company have a health team? I don't think people wonder about that anymore, right? Health, COVID and beyond is all spatial in nature. We can help people understand that and then combat those issues with geotechnologies and applied spatial thinking. And the other aspect of your question, um, my view in having worked in education for all these decades is that the place that you get your university degree from or your certificate, we could talk about certificate programs, is not as important as it used to be. And I think increasingly valued are international experiences. So the whole notion of does it have to be from a North American university? I, I love North American universities, but I also love, you know, University of Utrecht and I love, uh, you know, Kenyatta University in Nairobi. And I mean, there's so many good universities around. Um, I think it's important to focus on, you know, what you gained at that university, not that you have an X degree or certificate, but this is what you focused on. Again, thinking about putting that in your resume, your CV, or your story, and your story map, probably all three of those. The point is, um, sure, there are universities that specialize and they're well-respected, you know, for certain things. I mean, for, for years, the University of Wisconsin was, oh, it was a cartography specialty and they are still respected for that but they have lots of different facets so i don't think that the in my opinion the the place that the, the location where the university is is all that important especially now with online learning and you know you can be going to the university of uh, you know johns hopkins university you can be studying in you know um the uae so um in my view that location for the university is not as important as what you're focused on, the courses that you're taking, the, the things that you're producing, you know, you're again, thinking about the CV, your professional portfolio going forward, you know, what kinds of web mapping applications have you created? What kinds of analysis have you done? And put that in your professional portfolio. That, and to me, that's the most important thing. You folks are very quiet. I'm the one that should be quiet because it's, you know, it's still very early in the morning over here in Colorado, but, but I really appreciate uh, connecting with you all. And I, I just, again, I hope that these, these comments have been useful, helpful, uh, and that you'll, you'll be able to take some, some things in here and also go to that story map that, that I've got here. This is the bottom of it. You can see that I, I covered maybe 20% of it. I didn't cover very much. I also had a whole series of slides, these, that I covered maybe 10% of. So I've got a lot more content in here than uh, I'm actually able to cover in the amount of time we have. But again, I want to be respectful of your time and I know you've, you're busy people. Well, thank you so, so much, Joseph. Um, if it's okay with you, we'll be sure to share these links in the slides with the students and follow up. Um, I think that will be extremely helpful and we'll also be sure to share the recording with you all. Um, please do take just a few minutes to um, complete the, uh, the evaluation form that I linked in the chat, I'll also email that to you. Very helpful for us as we plan future sessions and, and how to um, build on what we've been offering. So with that, we will come to a close. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can send them to me and I can pass them on to Dr. Kersky. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful weekend.